Tom, did you want to read your recording? Uh, let me just go kind of go back to here. Welcome class, I forgot to record. All right, we're talking about memory. The smallest amount of memory that we address in Visual Basic for applications is eight bits. So the question is how do we store values uh, using eight bits? I want to store an integer here. And what do we have? You guys have heard this already, but the guys on YouTube haven't. So here's how we store a one. We say we're storing one, one, a two is one, two. If I want to store a three, it's a one and a two. If I want to store a four, it's just one, four. This then gets us to the value 65. So we've got a 64 and a one. So then what is this? I haven't heard it yet, so I heard close. 255, yeah, boy, you did that math so fast. You added 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 60. How did you do that so fast? Well, well you just realized that it's the next level is just twice what the one is before. So when this is all full up, it's one less than the next number in the series. So what's 128 times two? 256. So if I want 256, I would just have a, have a one in the 256 place, but then here it is one less than 256. So I'd be 255, right. Uh, okay, so what do I do then if I want to store something more than 255? Think about that. Let's actually, let's just go ahead and do this. So if you want to follow along right here, you go ahead and go back to Excel. Alt F11 will bring up the Visual Basic Editor. Um, now, last time we worked in Visual Basic, how did we get there? We recorded a macro and then we said, edit the macro. Uh, but today we're just gonna go and write a macro, a sub procedure from scratch. But when we recorded that macro, it made a module and that's where we put the stuff. So Alt F11 will get you there or how else could you get there? From the developer tab, uh, choose Visual Basic brings you to the same place. And I must have clicked on something else that I didn't mean to click on. Uh, so anyway, let me go ahead and get a module in. There are some references to the worksheets here. And the truth is, if you double click any of these objects, it's gonna bring a module up, but that's not a normal module. That's a special module. We don't want that one. Instead, we'll choose insert module. And that will give us the kind of module that we would have gotten if we recorded a macro. It's called a general module. All right, so I'm gonna make a sub procedure here, not recording it, I'm just typing it in. SUB, if your code does not say option explicit at the top, that's okay. We'll talk about that later in the course. Uh, I'll call this variables. B-A-R-I-A-B-L-E-S. And I'll hit enter and it's gonna say, oh, you gotta have opening and closing parentheses and you're gonna need an end sub on, ah, oh, put it in four automatically. I didn't even have to type it, that was so thoughtful. Okay, so let's say that I am making a variable of type byte. Here's how I do it. The keyword is dim, D-I-M. Um, it's actually short for the word dimension. And there's kind of a good reason why that's the name. We'll talk about it about halfway through the course, but it's, it seems like a weird word to use to make a variable, but that's it, dim. So we say dim, I'll just call it X as, and then I give it a type. And it turns out we actually have a type called byte, B-Y-T-E. So the data type byte allocates one byte of memory. It's the only one that, that says how many, you know, the size, the, the, that its name actually indicates the size but it's actually an integer. So the only thing I'm allowed to store in here is integers. I can't store a 1.5. Uh, and it really does allocate something that looks like this. You know, I've got one byte to work with. And so what do you think the range is, the valid range is for a byte? Zero to 255, yeah. So in fact, if I came in here and said X equals zero, or uh, in fact, you, don't you, you could just say that X equals zero, but it turns out the, the full syntax is let x equals zero. And that actually turns it into more of a command. I really love this command because it sounds to me, it sounds like the voice of God, let x equals zero. And it does, you know, it's like, ha. Ah. Um, but you don't have to type it, but it's kind of fun sometimes. Okay. So then I could say, oh, now we ended off last time talking about what? What, what, what were we talking about at the very end of class last time? It's another word for a thing. Yeah. Remember about objects? And then there were two characteristics of objects. They were methods, which is an activity the object knows how to do, and properties, something that describes the way the object is. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce you to another object just because it'll be helpful today here in class. The object is called debug. It's like a weird name for an object, but it's an object that has properties and methods that allow us to kind of figure out what's going on with our code. It has a method called print. 
So debug.print, and then I will give it something to print. I just want to print X. Now, that will print X then in something called the immediate window. So let me choose view immediate window. Came up here at the bottom. I'm gonna put it at the top because I know it's easier for you to see at the top. So I'm just gonna drag that window up to the top. So now it's called the immediate window because it allows me to immediately execute one line of VBA code. I could say, well, here's a syntax we haven't seen yet. I could say a one dot value equals 55. Just, I can put in brackets instead of quotes and it knows, oh, you're talking about a range reference. I'll hit enter to execute that line. Oh, and it has put 55 right here on my quotes. There is no quote 55. There is a quote two, which is where we were today. Let me go into a different sheet. So I can execute this by pressing enter. By the way, you don't have to be on the end. You can be anywhere in the line and hit enter. And it just executes that line. It says, oh, we're gonna put the value 55. Uh, in, we're gonna put 55 into the value property of range A1. But it happens that this immediate window is also where the debug, uh, or where the print method of the debug object will, will print stuff to. So when I run this, I'll just click run, it should allocate memory. It's gonna say to the operating system, hey, I want some memory. In fact, well, let's run it and we'll talk about what's really going on there. And so that should print zero. I should be able to, to print 255, let X equal 255 and run that and it prints 255. So what's happening here when I do this is that I, in VBA, I'm writing an instruction that says, hey, I wanna allocate some memory. How much memory do I wanna allocate? I'm telling it how much to allocate, how much is it? One byte and it's gotta have a location. It's gotta be at some place in memory. Do I care where it is? I couldn't care less. I mean, there's lots of it. How much memory do you have on your computer, do you know? probably eight or 16 gigabytes. I mean, that's a whole lot of memory. And we're only asking for one. What's a gigabyte? A byte is eight bits. A kilobyte is a, th is a thousand of those. It's actually 1,024 of those. A megabyte is 1,024 of those. A gigabyte is 1,024 of those. I mean, this is getting to be kind of big in a hurry. Uh, in fact, you can, like if you like use all of your memory on your computer to like put the, 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 the words of the Book of Mormon into memory, um, you could probably put the Book of Mormon in memory on your computer like 400, 4,000 times. It's a crazy number of times. That, and you got a lot, you got a lot of memory just there in the, in the computer. Um, and we're only talking about one. That's excellent. Ah, so what happens is this, I, I've told the VBA interpreter, that's the part of, of, of Excel that is looking at this and trying to figure out what I mean by the VBA I've written. And the interpreter goes, oh, I get it. You want to allocate some memory. And, and it says, well, I don't allocate memory alone. I got to talk to the operating system. So the interpreter says, hey, operating system, hey, Windows, I need some memory. And Windows is like, yeah, how much do you want? And it's going, you know, I just need a byte. Could you spare it? And it goes, yeah, no problem. And the, and the operating system says, here is your one byte of memory. And it tells back the address, the location where that memory is. And then my... Uh, interpreter then remembers X now is a name for that location in memory. And so now when I say let X equal 255, um, the interpreter then says, oh, we're going to put this value 255 into that location in memory. And what does it do? It says we got to change all of those bits to ones. One, 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 one. And it goes, great. We did it. 255. So later when I say print 255, it says, goes back and says, oh, I remember the address of where, where X is. When I say print X, it says, I remember the ad with the address. It goes and looks and it goes, oh, that's, that's a bunch of ones. I convert that to 255 and it prints 255. That's what's going on when we run this code. Now, if we look at that, that is completely full. I mean, what would happen if we tried to cram another one in there? Is it going to fit? I suppose you got a cup of hot chocolate and it was completely full. And you tried to put another marshmallow in. What would happen? See it, see it louder? It would overflow. That is exactly what it would do. Watch what happens when we do this. I am going to change this to 256. I'm only trying to put one more in. I'm going to run this. And I got, ooh, I got runtime error number six. Apparently, 
there were five errors they thought of before this one. This is the number six error. And it just says overflow. So what does that mean? Did it actually overflow? Did I, did I actually put one extra one in there and now I've got a bit rolling around inside my computer? Shake it, you know, it'll rattle now. I've got, you know, did it overflow? Well, no, what I'm saying is that, you know, it would, if, if I let that happen, it would overflow. There's no more room. You try to do something that would overflow memory and it just says, no. No, I can't do it. So it, so it stopped. Uh-oh, Windows minus, minus, minus. Okay, so let's go back to this. So that's uh, what we're doing. So what am I gonna do if I need to store 256? Turns out byte type doesn't do it for me. So fortunately, there's another type. Um, so, I mean, one, one byte isn't gonna do it. The truth is I could do it with just, if I had just one more bit, if I had nine bits instead of eight bits, that'd be okay. But what's the problem? I only touch memory in sets of eight bits at a time. And so my next choice is to go up to 16 bits, you know, a two byte variable. And so now we still have the same thing. We have zero, uh, we have one through 128, but then we keep going 256 on up to 32,768. Um, so we've now doubled the amount of memory. So that should double our range, right? We should be able to go twice as high. We've got twice as much memory. We should be able to go twice as high, right? No, what do you mean? What's wrong? One more bit doubles. I double my capacity with each bit. So I've doubled my capacity eight more times. So now I can store a number up to what? Yeah, 65,000 something, you know, really high. Okay, so let's just see if that's true. So it turned, well, so there's 256. So now I've just stored the one here in the 256, everything else is zero. And I probably have a couple others to look at here. Oh my gosh, what is that? Ah, a thousand. Not like I just didn't give this presentation about an hour ago, but a uh, thousand. And so there's a data type byte, range 0, 255. This is a data type integer. Let's take a look at integer. So I should be able to come and say integer. Again, both byte and integer can only hold integer values. I -N -T -H -E -R. But now I should be able to do 256, no problem. <sighs> okay, so I can go higher. How about lower? Hey, let's go back to byte. Oops. And what happens if I try to do negative one? Is this gonna fit in byte? What do you think? What's the, what's the range for byte? Zero, 255. So what am I gonna get here? I don't know, maybe an underflow? <laughs> Still an overflow. Overflow means you tried to put something in memory that doesn't fit. No way to put this in. And so, but what about integer? You think integer can do it? Yeah, integer is okay. So what is the, oops, what is it? So what's going on here? Ah, <sighs> let's take a look at what happens when we allocate an integer. So here we've got a bunch of ones and zeros now in memory, right? They're not, they're not really ones and zeros. I don't even know what they are um, in silicon. They're not magnetic. Um, somehow you can change something from one state to another. You can tell what it is. That's how it happens. We think of them as ones and zeros. Now I've got some of these with a blue background and some of these with a gray background. What's different about them? Any thoughts? Can you divine what I was thinking when I made the slide? Mm, what does gray mean? Mm, anyone want to guess? Anytime when I'm looking at memory, some of that memory is allocated for use in some program. It might be my program. It might be some different program. In the early days of accessing memory, we actually said, I want a particular address. I want to put something at a particular address in memory. We actually worked with addresses in memory. Ugh. But now, but that was okay then because we only ever had one program running at, we didn't have an operating system. We just had one program running at a time. Now, can you imagine if you were actually telling it which address you wanted? 
and you're writing your little program and you're saying, I want this little spot in memory. Well, what happens if YouTube wants that spot in memory too? Or Spotify wants that spot in memory? You guys will be fighting over the same spot in memory. And so the operating system keeps track of which memory has been allocated to which programs in the very early days of Windows. One of the things that used to happen all the time was you'd have a program that would try to access memory that hadn't been allocated to it. And when that happened, you would get something called a general protection fault, a GPF fault, and your computer would just die like that. Boom, you're dead. Uh, and you'd reboot. That would happen three or four times a day. Um, it was delightful. <laughs> but we could use the mouse, so that was okay. So, um, so some of this memory is available, some isn't available. Now here's the question. If I'm saying, hey, I need, I need a couple of bytes of memory, oh, you know, where could that memory start? What do you think? Could it start, but use the mouse for the video. Could it start right here? Could it start, could my, could my variable start at this address? In fact, you know, that particular, that particular one has an address. This particular one has an address. You know, every single bit in memory has its own address. In fact, incidentally, you have, almost, I'd be certain that everyone in this room has what we refer to as a 64-bit operating system. Have you heard of it? 64-bit operating system. What does that mean, 64-bit operating system? It means it can handle, it can address memory. To be able to address all of its memory, it needs 64 bits to be able to address every single piece of memory. It's not 64 bits of memory. It is, I, I, I have to use 64 bits to be able to have enough numbers to assign one to each bit that I have. So what's the difference between a 64 bit and a 32 bit operating system? Th with 32 bits, I can address a maximum of four gigabytes of memory. So if I have a 32 bit operating system and I have 16 gigabytes of memory, am I using all of those? No, because the operating system can only see four gigabytes. That's why we have to, we, to be able to access more memory, we need operating something to handle you know, more address space. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that when I say dim x as integer, we're gonna find some place, or the operating system is gonna find some place that says, here are 16 bits in a row that you can use. Could it start right here, part way up, and say, well, we'll take eight up here and eight down here after this block that's already allocated to something else? The answer is no. Any time I allocate memory, it must be contiguous. Oof. Okay. Now, do you, do you have to remember that for the exam? No, because you don't have to think about that. All you have to think about is dim x as integer, right? And the rest of this happens. Uh, so that then becomes the, you know, the memory that's allocated for this variable. And so x then, so this then is the address of that variable. I've shown it here in two different notations. Here's the address written in decimal. Here's the address, which is normally how we do add memory addresses, written in, what is this, anyone know? It's hexadecimal, which is base 16. So here's base 10, you have 10 symbols to work with. Here's um, hexadecimal, base 16. You have 16 symbols to work with. So it's basically zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. So the letter A actually stands for the quantity that you're thinking of as 10. B means 11 and so forth. Why would you ever do that? Why would we use base, I mean, base 16 has got to be more difficult to work with than base 10. Why do we use base 16? Right? This all goes down to base two and 16 is a power of two. And so if we think about it in base 16, the math is a lot easier. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have to do that math in this class. Uh, okay, so that's what's going on when we declare the variable. So now let's talk about what's, what's happening when we can, you know, how can an integer let me do a negative value? And here's what we do it. Here's what we do. First thing you have to realize is the only thing that we can store in memory are integers, right? It, it turns out we store them in base two, but there's no decimal places in memory. Only thing in memory is what? Zeros and ones. And so we got to store everything just as a number uh, and, and, and just as an integer number, a, a positive integer. Well, a non-negative. We could have zero plus the positive integers. And so we store... Um, some number, and then we add it to some negative number when we're actually going to print it out. So here's what happens, is we say, all right, let's go ahead and store 1,000 here in our two bytes of RAM. That's what 1,000 looks like. And if we have stored that as an integer, then what um, the interpreter does is it says, okay, 
you just told me to store a number. I'm going to figure out to do it like this. But as it's reading it out, it says, all right, I see that we have 1,000 stored there. So I'm going to take negative 32,768. I'm going to add 1,000 to it. And that, then, is the number that's actually stored. So to be able to get a negative number, we say we store some integer. Then we say, ah, but we don't start counting at 0. We start counting at negative 32,768. Whew, there was a hand over here somewhere. Yeah. Where does the negative number come from? It's actually a text box on the slide. I just put it right in there. You'll see. You'll understand why that. It seems like a weird number. And you'll see why it's that number uh, when we go. We got a couple more slides here. So here I'm storing 32,767. And that is negative 1. And here's the reason that that number, that bottom number is 32,768 is because when I store 32,768, when I put a one in that very first spot, then that's what zero is. So I can essentially think of this almost as if there's a one there, I mean, and we don't, in VBA, we don't ever have to think about that, right? But as we're designing this, if I, if I know there's a one there, then hey, that's zero. So I could have a thousand plus that one set over there, and that really is then 1,000. So that's basically half of my range. So that means that the range, so there's all the way filled up, is, would be 65,535. I add that to some negative number, and here we have. So the range then for the integer type is plus or minus 32,768. Okay, I told you I'm going to point you to the things I want you to remember for the exam. Um, the, the, the variable byte. I want you to know that stores integers, and it's, 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 the range is 0 to 255. The data type integer, I want you to know that, no, that stores integer. That one's kind of a giveaway, right? Because it tells you it's integer. It stores integers. Um, and I don't expect you to know the range like this, but I do expect you to know the range 32,000, plus or minus 32,000, you know, roughly plus or minus 32,000. So if I said, you know, what data type would you choose to store, a, a, to, use a, to make a variable that has to go from anywhere from 0 to 10,000, what would you tell me? Yeah, integer would be great for that. Could I use byte for that? Byte's no good, right? Byte only goes to 255, gotta go to 10,000, but integer's great because it can go 32,000. Okay, so there's another integer type called long integer. It's actually just called long, but it means long integer. It's four bytes, and so uh, I want you to remember this, roughly plus or minus two billion. So that's pretty good. That's a long integer. So, um, and those are the integer types. Actually, it turns out there's one other integer type now that we have 64-bit. Of course, this language was written long before 64-bit was even thought of. Um, they you know, if someone was thinking about it, they probably would have said, someday we'll have 64-bit operating systems, but we're not worried about them now. Uh, and so, you know, your long integer can go pretty big, but you can't address all of memory with that. So there's actually one more data type that does integers. You want to know what it's called? <laughs> you don't need to know this for the test or anything. But this is long, but the other one is really long, and so it is called long, long. <laughs> uh, it's eight bytes, and it's huge. OK. So how about decimal values? Remember, we can only store integers. So how, oh my gosh, how are we going to do decimal values? There's a couple of options. The first one is to say, well, use an integer to store some number, we'll store some integer, and then we'll say, aha, but we know, even though it's an integer, we know there's four decimal places. So I'll divide by 10,000 to change it, but that'll move the decimal place over, over four times. And so if I, if I was, it turns out the smallest um, fixed point type that we have is four bytes or eight bytes? I think it's four bytes. We'll see it here in just a minute. Um, but if I, had a, if I had two bytes, I'd say, oh, okay, well, I'm storing the number, 65,535, that's the whole thing filled up. That's all I can do in two bytes. But because I know that this is a fixed point number, I'm storing it to four decimals of percent. Every one of this particular data type, it's called currency. But of this data type, they're always stored to four decimal points of precision. So I don't have to think about where the decimal goes. I know it always goes in the same place. I divide by 10,000. And I'm, what I'm really representing here is 6.5535. Does that make sense? Store an integer and then just say the decimal point goes here. 
so what if I store something different? So 52,500 divided by 10,000, that's really how I would store 5.25. So here's the dead type. Oh, it's not four bytes, it's eight bytes. So it's big. It's, it's roughly plus or minus 922 billion. So uh, truth is, I'm not expecting you to know details about the currency type for the exam, but um, that's there. And, and that's how we can do, that's one way to do decimals. But what if I need more precision than four decimals? What if sometimes I need a couple of decimal points and other times I need seven decimal points? What do I do? Well, that's option two. So the second option is to say, well, still store an integer. That's all we can ever do. Store an integer and then we'll take part of the memory to store another integer. So we've got all this memory, we'll use part of it to store our integer, and then part to store another integer that tells us where the decimal point goes. So just imagine there's no, there's no two byte floating point number. It's called a floating point number. Um, but imagine that there was, and so we'd say, listen, so we are storing 3,574 with the numbers that we have up here. And then up here in the green, we're saying, this part is telling us where the decimal place goes. And what is it saying where the decimal place goes? It's, it's, it's saying how, how many columns do you move the decimal point to the left? And we say it's, it's moving at zero. And so this really is 3,574. But if, it's, if in the green we're saying store one, we're saying move it over one. If we're saying store two, move it over two. If we're saying store three, move it over three. If we fill that up as much as we can go, we're saying move it over 15. So 3,574, 15 points, that's where the decimal place goes. Okay? So that's the idea of a floating point number. We, we take part of the memory and we say, where does the decimal point go? And then the rest gives us an integer that we use as the base, as the base number. And so the smallest floating point number we have is four bytes and it's called single. The data type is single and it is, it stands for single precision floating point number. And your range is, I, I don't even know how to say that number. But what we're saying is that uh, even though it can go that big, it's only precise to seven significant digits. So that means we can store seven digits and then we've got the ability to move the decimal really far. So we can go you know, really high or really low, or we can go really, really precise, right? So we could say, you know, that's the integer that we're storing and put the decimal point here, or put the decimal point here, right? Make it really, really small. But again, the precision that we have in it is only seven significant digits. Does that make sense? Uh, same thing with double precision floating point number, although the numbers get really kind of comical here. So that's your range. So you can do really, really big numbers or really, really, really precise numbers, but um, you've got uh, only 15 digits of uh, precision, significant digits of precision. Now, it turns out the, the actual implementation in VBA is just a little bit different than this. It's a little bit more complex than this, but not really very much, but it's beyond what we need to do here. In fact, the truth is, what I've already told you is beyond what we needed to do you know, for this class. Ah, so, but let's understand dates. Remember, all we can store is an integer, so here's what we do. We say, store an integer, and that's the number of days, either before or after, some index date, which uh, happens to be, did I go past it? Oh, yeah, which happens to be, I love this, December 30th, 1899. <laughs> Who picks December 30th, 1899? I don't know, but that's the, that is the index date in VBA. So here we're storing uh, 27,945. 27,945 days after December 30th, 1899 is? Wow. July 4th, 1976. So the great bicentennial celebration. You weren't alive for that, but I was. I almost remember. Uh, but how about then a date and a time? So what we do is instead of storing well, of course we store an integer, but we use some of what we've learned already to say, oh, what well, we could, using what we know about floating point numbers, we could store a fractional number. It has to be integers, a couple of different integers. But now we're storing the day and the portion of a day. So this is gonna get us to that same day. The decimal point then gets us to a part of the day. So we can, and, and with that decimal point, we can get precise. We can get more precise than seconds. 
We can't quite get to milliseconds in this scheme, but we can get to sub-second precision accuracy. So date type is eight, takes eight bytes for a date type, and your range is midnight, January 1st, the year 100, to 1231, the year 9999. Um, we don't have to worry about actually getting there, but I could imagine needing dates outside of that range. Can you? Yeah, what might you need dates outside of that range for? Yeah, if you're doing anything historical, you know, I mean, the year 100, that's not very long ago. That's like not even 2,000 years ago. So, uh, I mean, you're, anyway, there's lots, of, there's lots of reasons why you might need dates outside of that range. Um, but you'd have to do them some other way than using the built-in date type. Okay, how do we do names then? Uh, remember, the only thing we can store is an integer. So how do we get to an A? How are we going to do it? And the answer is, we take each character and we map it to, or take, uh, we map it to a number between 0 and 255. So using one byte, we can represent 256 different characters. So here is 65 again, and 65 is mapped to capital A. That's what capital A is. What's capital B? 66. Oh, I don't have 66. Anyway, it would just be 66. Capital C, 67. Lowercase d, 100. You're just counting up. You know, you get there. There's some things between the lower uppercase letters and the lowercase letters. I'm going to turn this on its side. So instead of being this way for an A, I'm going to turn it this way, just so we can see what does it look like if we want to do out like a whole string, like Adams, comma, space, John. All right, so the A is 65, lowercase d is 100, uh, lowercase a is 97, and so forth. Well, wait a minute. Does even the comma and the space have a number? Yeah, those are characters, and they are mapped to, a, uh, to the table. The table that we use is called the ASCII table. And so if you just Google ASCII table, you'll see lots of places that are giving this information for the price of advertising. But we can see up here that we've got uh, capital A is up here as number 65. Here it is. Uh, lowercase d is 100. The space was 32. There it is. Now, it turns out the first 32, 0 through 31, these are all actually non-printable characters. And it really seems strange to me that we even still use these. But, you know, it turns out that and once you have a standard in place, it's really tough to move, even though we have not very much use for most of the characters that are below 32 these days. Have you ever seen like a movie that's dealing with uh, a newsroom in the 1970s or 1980s? It always, you know, if you ever you know, hear that, you always hear all kinds of chatter. It sounds like you've got 80 people typing on typewriters as fast as they can type. This is the, kind of this chatter that's always happening in the background. Well, th what, those, what that is, is that's like remote correspondence sending in the stories to be printed in the newspaper. And essentially what that is, is it's a, it's called a teletype machine. And it's like, it's like you've got a typewriter with a telephone in the middle of it. And so on one side, you, you're putting it, it's actually stored over there, but you're sending it across the line. And you are, you're saying, I've got a printer on the other end of this. I send 65 across the line. And that printer goes 65, A. And it strikes the paper and makes an A. And then I say, you know, send 100. It goes lowercase d. And it strikes the paper and makes a lowercase d. Well, if you think about those printers that are actually physically striking the paper and they're going across, once they get to the end of the line, what do they got to do? Yeah, they got to return. And you might want to return before they get to the end of the line. And so if you want it to return, you actually send it a 13. You say 13, and that sends the print head back. Uh, what's the problem if you just send the print head back? I mean, if you just, you just typed a bunch of stuff and you send the print head back, what are you going to do? You're right, right over the top of the same stuff. So you also have to send it a 10 because 10 is line feed. Adjust, you know, push the paper up, move the print head back. So some of these are, you know, do we ever have to tell it, move the print head back? Well, it turns out those two characters, number 13 and number 10, those are still ones that we actually use. Of all of those are probably the ones that are used the most because those are the characters we use to actually indicate, you know, here in this whole long, I mean, if you think about a string, it's actually one long string in memory. It's one character right after another. It's a single variable. It has to be located contiguously. So how does your, how does Notepad, your text editor, know when to move down to the next line? And the answer is, in Windows, you're going along all these characters, and then you say, character 13, 
Carriage return, character 11, line feed, and it goes, oh, 1310, I know, I know what that is. Go back to the next line and start again. So we actually still use the carriage return. In Unix, it's only the line feed character. In Mac OS 9, it was just the carriage return character. Mac OS 10 is line feed now as well, this one. But in Windows, it actually still uses both. It's a two character sequence to indicate the end of the line. Interesting. Uh, how about this one? I love this one. Number seven, audible bell. Do you remember? You probably never you ever worked on, really worked on a typewriter. I did, but you type along and then it rings to tell you you've got five characters before you run off the page. Better hit enter here, you know, pretty soon to send yourself back. But anyway, these are still mapped. Um, even though I know of no use for the audible bell, you know, at least not, not in text files anymore. Go ahead. Ah, so here's what we have. I'm only showing you 127. These are the ones that are standard. And there's 256. And those top 256, they're, they're sometimes different, you know, kind of depending on configuration. How many of you ever been to a web page and you've got some strange character that you go, you know, I'm pretty sure that should be a quote, but that's not a quote there. That's because they weren't using a quote because quote is like 34, where's 34? 34 is double quote right there. Probably hard to see, but there's double quote. But instead, what did they use? They used the quotes that Word puts in, those fancy quotes that look different for opening quotes than for closing quotes. Well, those aren't in the first 128. Those are in the next set over, and those aren't standard. Those, those aren't always the same. And so you, you wrote it as a double quote, curly double quote, and then the operating system that was sending it out said, oh yeah, I know that character. It's this you know, funky character like an N with a tilde on it or something. So that's, um, that's really where that is. Now, there are even more characters in 128. So that gets into something called Unicode. So this says we're using one byte per character. If we're gonna use Unicode, we might use two bytes per character or four bytes per character, depending on what the alphabet is. That's way more complex than we're trying to do today. But there is possible to do even more than just the 256 that you know, are available to us here. But this is the way that's, that's built in with uh, VBA. So, um, so it turns out, out of all the data types we've used so far, they've been, before string, they've been fixed data types, uh, fixed length data types, which means when you declare the variable, dim x as integer, when you declare the variable, you are allocating a fixed amount of memory. You've allocated two bytes and there is nothing that will change how much memory variable x takes up, right? Because if you try to put more into it, what will it do? Well, overflow will give you an error. Sorry, I'm not going to get bigger for you. You've got to you know, conform to what you said, only two bytes. Now, string is different. String is a variable length data type. And the reason is, is because we need one character per, uh, one byte per character that we're storing. And so this then becomes the first data type that we've seen that has overhead. Oof. So that means that we have four bytes. When we declare a string variable, even if we don't put anything in it, we just declare a string variable, immediately four bytes get used to say how long is the string. And then we use one byte per character. So if we look here, what this is telling us is that up over here in overhead, you know, we can go anywhere up to like four billion characters, but we say we've got a one, a two, a, f a one, a two, and an eight. eight Nine, 10, 11, that's 11. So what this part of the memory is saying is it's saying there's 11 characters. What the interpreter does is it reads the first four bytes and it says, what's the number? It goes 11, it goes great. It reads the next 11 bytes. And it says, that's the end of the string. And so it reads these next 11 characters. So it actually has to kind of go at memory twice. First, read the first four, that'll tell you how much to read and then read the rest. And then we take those numbers, we take each eight bits, we convert it into an integer, we map it to the table, and we go A, D. It goes one at a time, only it happens crazy fast, right? Okay, so that's the data type string. So, it, it, so how much you use depends on what you're putting into it. Um, but it's always a minimum of four, then plus one byte per character. So imagine that you know, we've got memory here, and you know, we dim name as a string. How much memory is gonna get allocated because of this statement. As soon as I say dim name as string, how much? Yeah, four bytes. It, and, and what's it gonna put in those four bytes? 
It's input zero. Yeah, whole thing is zero. It's saying here's a string variable. How many characters do we have to read? Zero. Okay, there's nothing in it. Great, but it's still a string variable. So, you know, we might say operating system, we want dim name as a string, and it goes great. You're going to need um, four bytes, and here's the address. So it goes great. Name, the interpreter is remembering, name refers to that address, and those are the bytes then that we're talking about. And it will initialize those to all zeros. So that when the interpreter says, go read that variable, it reads the zeros and goes, I'm done. Nothing else to read. There's nothing in this string. Now, let's suppose that we change that. We want to say name equals Adams John. Can we just extend the memory out another 11 bytes? Looking at this diagram, what do you think? Why not? Yeah, there's, and memory's allocated right here. We've got some gray here, which to us means, ah, this memory is in use by somebody else. Well, what are we going to do? Well, it turns out every variable has to be allocated contiguously. And so we can't just do that. We're going to have to find another place that we can allocate enough memory to record the whole thing. Oh, and I hope that someday you'll actually look at that and go, oh, wow, my goodness, that really does say John Adams in that diagram. <sighs> the first four bytes really say 11, and then we have 65, and then we have 100. Anyway, all right. So, and now, but now we've actually moved it to a new location, incidentally. Uh, it is not free. Uh, allocating memory is not free. It takes some, it's not a whole long time, but it takes some time. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to show you how to do, I'm going to show you how to read a text file off the disk. We've got a text file, you want to read the characters in. We can either say read the whole file in at once, or we could say read one line in at a time, or we could say read one character at a time, or, you know, 12 characters. We can tell it the number of characters you want to read. Um, it's actually really kind of interesting because when the language was written, it was back when there wasn't very much memory. So you didn't have to have a very big file before you went, I can't put this whole file in memory. So the language was written to be able to handle files that were larger you could put in memory. And now you've got 16 gigabytes. Is there any text file bigger than 16 gigabytes? Yeah, because now we've got all kinds of huge data sets to deal with. So it turns out that VBA is still really good with dealing with very large data sets because it can read just portions. It doesn't have to read the whole file at once. It just go read these characters or whatever. One of the things you could do is you could say, okay, I've got a variable called f. It's for my file. And I say, read the first character off the file and put it into f. All right, now read the second character and just make f equal what it used to be plus the next character. And I could do that for every single character. Well, in, if I did that, you know, in, in terms of the time it actually takes to read the file and get the information out, that's not a big deal. But it would really slow down because of the process of each time I added another character on, it would have to find another place in memory that it could write to, and it would write it to a new place in memory. It, so it would end up writing that file as many times as there is characters in the file into a different place in memory, which would be dramatically slower than just saying, figure out how much I need, and then allocate that much at once. Anyway, well, that's probably more than you need to think about. We'll get to that later in class. Somehow, in my presentation, I have missed an important data type. So let's come over here and do it inside of VBA. So uh, we've talked about integers, floating point numbers, fixed point numbers, dates, strings. There's another one. Let me dim a variable called B as a data type called Boolean. Boolean, Boolean. Sounds like a strange word. Named after George Boole, who was a mathematician in the 18th century who, who studied logical arithmetic. Um, you might remember in your pre-algebra class, you had to do truth tables. True and true equals what? True. True and false equals false. True or false equals true. You had, to, you had to be able to produce these, you know, on demand, you know, in your class. Um, and you have George Boole to thank for that. You know, he's the one that really kind of mapped out the whole idea of, of um, uh, logical arithmetic. Uh, in fact, today, so much so that we call that Boolean logic. And so this type is called Boolean, and it will hold only a type of true or false. You can see I say B equals, and it tells me you've got two choices here, true or false. Uh, and so I could now do a print, debug.print B, and that should just print the word true. You know, I could do things. We'll talk about this. Um, I'm still printing negative one over here. Let me just 
I'll leave this here, but let me exit out. So I'm only doing the part with um, B. You know, and then of course with logical stuff, you can do you know, all kinds of logical things. Print, uh, not B. Not B is what? Yeah, that would be false. Uh, not B or B. Oops. That's true. So apparently the not binds onto this first. Uh, and then, of course, if we bound that with parentheses, we will get into um, Boolean logic once we start talking about conditional statements. But that's what they're used for. They're used for things that are going to be true or false, and you know, we're going to manipulate them in one way or another. As it turns out, we can convert. Um, there are functions to convert among these different data types. So I could take a Boolean type, false, and I could convert it to an integer. What do you think it's going to be? Yeah, it'll be zero. Um, I could convert uh, true. What do you think? Aha! I got gotcha. you. It's negative one. I don't know why it's negative one. There's probably a good reason for it to be negative one. <laughs> That's what it is. In fact, as it turns out, let's do this. Let's go the other way. Let's convert to Boolean. Um, zero, of course, uh, will be false. Negative one, of course, will be true. But any other non-zero number will also be true. So you got false and anything else, false is zero. Anything else is true. Uh, in terms of converting. And this actually brings an interesting thing, is that I don't even have to use those converting functions. I could say B, I could say B equals 100. That seems so strange. B can only take on true or false. B equals 100? What? You got true or false to choose from here, buddy. And in truth, in truth, most respectable programming languages would look at a statement like this, and what would they say? Yeah, they would say, what are you talking about? I, I don't know what you were thinking, and apparently you don't know what you were thinking either. I'm not going any further. But the whole philosophy behind VBA, I and mean, this was a conscious decision they made when they were making the language, they said, you know what? When the user hasn't quite got it right, let's make our best guess. And so this conversion that we do explicitly with CBool here, when I try to do this assignment that, that clearly is a type mismatch, it's not the right type, VBA, all on its own, is going to say, hmm, I wonder if I can figure out what he was talking about. Um, and the answer is yes. It's going to go, oh yeah, you know what? We'll just convert that. That you must have meant, you must have, oh, I'm printing not B or B. Let's just go back to printing B. You must have meant true. A non-zero integer maps the true. We can, got to, we can do the same thing, by the way convert to integer, um, even with strings, right? We could say um, 45. So because that's in quotes, that's a string 45, uh, and to convert that to an integer, it goes, oh yeah, 45. Uh, how about 45.55? What do you think? Yeah, 46. Oh, and convert that to an integer? Well, it's not even a, a number, so can I make it a number? Yeah, oh, it's not an integer. What am I gonna do? I'll, I'll round it. It is. If you don't want to round it, you just want to take the integer portion of it. It's, it's just int instead of c. And there's all kinds of functions like for doing stuff like that. Uh, how about this? 4,005. What do you think? Truth is, I can't remember, but I would be surprised if it'll convert that. Oh, it did! <laughs> Even with the comma, it figured it out. I wonder if c int does. It must. Yeah. Um, Here's the one that I think it should do that it doesn't do. I mean, that I think it should figure out, but it just says, no, I can't figure that one out. Uh, maybe the guy who wrote it was Spanish. No. French? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's got to be a number, not numeric. Okay. So that's, that's the Boolean type. So the type that's Boolean just takes true or false, um, and that's useful. Okay. One more data type to go. Um, and that is the one that if I was, if I was organizing this presentation based on, I wanted your minds to be the, the freshest, this was the one I would have started with. Um, because this one, this takes a little more brain power. So I don't know, should we do head, shoulders, knees, knees and toes? Maybe do once there was a snowman or something, wake up. 
why don't we just take a, what, let's do take a moment and stand. Um, move just a little bit and let's get ready to do something that will require some thought. A little shadow boxing, you know, might be good. We could bring my wife in, she'd do some yoga with you. She's a yoga instructor. All right, we don't want to get carried away, that's enough, have a seat. All right, so there's another data, so far, all the data types that we've talked about have been simple. They have held a single value. Now, the string may be arguable. You might say each one of those characters is a value, but, but still we can say that's just, it's just one, it's like one name, it's one value that we're storing there. Objects, one way to think about objects, remember we talked about objects, an object is a, another word for an object is, yeah, it's a thing. And there's two characteristics that are really important to us about objects, they are properties and methods. Okay, we're not talking about the methods right now, we're just talking about the properties. And so if you think about it, a property is just like a value. It's like a variable, right? A property is like a variable. Well, one way to think about objects is to think, oh, an object is a collection of variables. It's, it's a bunch of variables that kind of work together. I'm going to need all of these variables working together whenever I use them. And so let's just make an object that's got multiple variables in it. And so we look here, we've got something called range two. It's got lots of properties. It has lots of variables, lots of values it needs to store. Now, it's also smart enough to say when you change that value, it's gonna change something about the way the object displays and it's got all kind of logic to handle that you know, built into the object. But at its simplest level, it's just a collection of variables that we want to move together as a set. And so here we have this object, range A2. It is, it is sitting somewhere in memory. It really is somewhere in memory. You know, if we, could, if we could go back and look at all those ones and zeros, we could point and say, ah, that zero right there, that is where this object starts. Just like an integer starts at a place and then goes for a while, uh, a range starts at a place and it goes for, it's a little longer while. Um, and the truth is, all of these values don't need to be contiguous. You know, so each of these values could be pointing off to a different location in memory, but you know, the address itself has to be contiguous, but it doesn't have to be right next to the formula. So there's a little more flexibility here, but the point is the object itself is, you know, starts at some place in memory. Now, what we've done so far when we referred to objects, like we said, like range A1 equals, and then you know, some name. That's not, that's not too bad. I mean, to get to the object by saying range A1, but we were, we were making lots of assumptions when we said range A1. We assumed, what did we assume? First of all, how many A1s are there in my workbook? Tell me. There are five. This workbook has five sheets and therefore it has five A1s. Well, well wait a minute. Let me, let me just print what's in A1. Here's a syntax I don't ever use because I learned it way after I learned VBA. In square brackets, you don't even need quotes, you can just say a1 dot value. Um, and how does it know which a1? There's five of them to choose from. Yeah, it said, oh, you didn't tell me which sheet. You must mean the active sheet. So I could have said, let me do it down here, uh, debug.print range. I could use the other syntax in here, but I want to make it a little bit more wordy. a1 dot value um, and that's all I'm printing so that should just print 55 here okay but I could specifically talk about the sheet that I mean and that is out of all the worksheets we're gonna get familiar with, with you know ad addressing these other objects the one called sheet one sheet one no space and now that's the one I'm talking about, even if it's not the active sheet. Let me quote the active sheet and run this. It's still that one because I told it. You don't have to guess which one I'm talking about. Well, I've made another assumption. You know what the assumption is? Which workbook? I could have multiple workbooks open. So I am talking about, oh, out of all the workbooks, I am talking about the workbook called Ah, oh, founding quotes on XLSX. <sighs> Whoops. Dot worksheets. And I'm getting, so the point is, oh, and you know what? Maybe it's not A1. Maybe it's range A1 to A22. And I don't want the value of that. I want 
cell number 16 in that, and I want the address. And not A1, let's do A5 to A22. So I want the 16th cell of that range on that sheet of that workbook, and I'll run that. That happens to be cell number A20. I'm, but I'm just getting started because I could have multiple instances of Excel open. And so I've got to tell which Excel I have open. The one that we're currently in is called application. But I could have others open and they would have different names. And so that is the one I'm talking about. I still get down to A20. Okay, the point is getting to the object you're talking about is not necessarily an easy thing. But what does all of this right up to here, what does all of that evaluate to? When the interpreter says, all right, I got some work to do here. We're talking about this application, we're talking about this workbook, we're talking about this worksheet, we're talking about this range, we're talking about this cell. Ultimately, it's finding what? It is finding what? Just the part that I have highlighted there. It's, it's finding an object, but it's finding that object where it's located in memory. I mean, to be able to manipulate it, it has to be in memory. And so all of that gets down to a particular memory address. Well, all an object variable is, is it says, I've just gone through a lot of work to get to this address. And you know what, I'm gonna have to do three or four things with this range. I don't wanna have that all, can you imagine if your code had that whole long time every time you wanted to refer to that particular thing? And so, what an object variable is, it allows us to say, oh, I just wanna remember that address. Dim, RNG, as an object. And now instead of printing this, I am gonna say RNG equals, now not all the way to the address, I wanna just do to the, where I've identified the object. And then in fact, I will print RNG.address. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, I want to, to identify an object here, that gets me to an address, I just wanna remember that address. So that later I can say something a little simpler and then refer to any of the objects or properties that I want there. Now, there's one little trick. Remember down here we had to say, or we, we could say let x equal negative one. When we're doing an object variable, I have to say something in front of it, but it's not let, it's set. So I have to say, oh, I'm binding an object variable onto an object. So I use the keyword set that allows that to happen. So now this should still print a 20 when I run this. Uh, there it is. There's one more little trick here, and that is, when I say object, I could bind this variable RNG, like I've done here, I could do that onto any kind of object. I could bind it onto this range one time, next time I could bind it onto a chart, next time I could bind it onto an image, next time I could bind it onto a worksheet, a workbook, or the application itself. If I know I only ever wanna bind this onto a range, I can say dim it as a range. It's still an object, it's exactly the same as an object, except now I can only bind it onto range object. But the real reason that you might do that is because when it's actually set as a range, in my code, when I type RNG and dot, it goes, <laughs> I know what you're talking about, that's gotta be a range. Here are the things you can do with ranges. And so it'll give you the IntelliSense help. So if you're binding onto a worksheet, you would you dim S as worksheet, and then your code would, would be helpful to you. Oh, that was a marathon and you, you hung in there. Um, my hope is that you'll feel pretty comfortable with everything we did until we got to, to object variables. And for that one, you'll be going, I need a little time with this one, that's okay, because we'll, we'll, I'll give you some time. I'll give you some more experience with it. So I wanted to get introduced to it. Okay, folks, thank you for coming. Oh, I held you over by a couple of minutes, sorry about that. Class dismissed.